Sometimes we have pain that's old pain from something that happened a long time ago, you know, phantom pains and memory pains, and sometimes Teasel turns that off. So sometimes it reboots that nervous system computer. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. Well, it was a delight to finally sit down with Doc Jones. He's a celebrated herbalist and veterinarian who has inspired many with his incredible case studies. I've known about Dr. Patrick Jones for many years and was excited to finally meet him in real life through Zoom. (laughs) Our conversation covers many topics from healing wounds to rattlesnake bites, which is my personal question, and to the wonders of Teasel. For those of you who don't already know him, Dr. Patrick Jones is a clinical herbalist, traditional naturopath, and practicing veterinarian. Because of his veterinary credentials, he's been able to use herbs to treat cases that most herbalists don't get to address. Cases like rattlesnake bites, gunshot wounds, and serious disease make up his daily practice. Because of the amazing things he's seen herbs do, both in his naturopathy and veterinary practices, Doc has an evangelical zeal to teach others about medicinal plants. This passion gave rise to the founding of the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. Well, welcome to the show, Patrick. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm really happy to be here. I've been uh, anxious to visit with you. We've sort of been in contact off and on over the years, and I always thought I thought it'd be fun to actually sit down and talk to you. So I'm excited. Likewise, likewise. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited as well. Um, very excited to talk about the plant that you chose because it's the first time that plant's on the show. But before we get there, I would love to hear more about you and how you found yourself on this meandering path of naturopathy and veterinarian and <laughs> herbs and all of it. Yeah. How does that happen to a guy? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I guess uh, as a kid, I actually started out as an edible plants guy. That's where I started. <laughs> um, really, you know, big fan of Yule Gibbons and Boy Scouts and wilderness survival and and all that fun stuff. And, uh, you know, as you learn about plants you can eat, you know, pretty soon you're learning about one that's maybe good for this or good for that for medical things. Uh, but mostly it was edible plant stuff. And then I went to South America. I was, in, I was a missionary down in South America for a while in Peru. And uh, the first night I was there, I was really broken out. You know, I was about 19 or 20 and I was really broken out and the little I walked into the home of the sweet little lady that was gonna uh, put me up until I got on a bus and went somewhere else and she looks at my face and says oh pobrecito vaya al mercado y comprate maita right poor little thing go to the market and buy some maita right I don't know what the heck maita is so I go down to the market and there's all these cute little Peruvian ladies sitting on blankets with stuff they're selling and I'm going to each lady and saying, do you have some maita? And they look at me, these, these are candles, buddy. You know, <laughs> these are frying pans. <laughs> and eventually they pointed me to the right direction. I found a lady that had a big pile of leaves on her blanket. And so I bought a bag of them and took them back to the lady. And she threw them in a pot and got them steaming and stuck my head over the pot and put a towel over it and uh, to fix my face, you know, to fix my skin. And it cleared it right up. I felt, you know, markedly better. Uh, shortly after that and and living with those folks down in peru for the time that i did really i mean they are really living close to the land still you know they still really have an intimate connection to the plants that we in north america have are losing you know Mm -hmm. um and so it really sort of fired me up about the and i had a lot of other experiences like that in peru you know with people fixing this and fixing that and 
um, just having that, you know, if you have this problem, you go out in the yard and you get this, or you go out in the forest and get that. And it was just a really beautiful uh, cultural connection that they had with the plants. Um, and so when I came home, uh, you know, went to school, went to veterinary school, and of course they beat all that out of you. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> they have a different tool set. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I got into practice, I started fiddling around with herbs and doing this and that and having good success. And and I had a, a dog came in that was actually dying of liver failure, really, really sick. And her gums were just dark yellow or the whites of her eyes were dark yellow, you know, and modern medicine really has nothing for that. You know, we can support them. You put them on an IV and make them feel better, but we don't have a, a medicine to fix a liver that's in that kind of shape. And uh, one of my buddies came into the clinic for something else and said, um, holy cow, what's wrong with that dog? And I said, oh, she's just really struggling and, and probably not going to make it. And he says, oh, you ought to call Mickey. He'll straighten her out. And so Mickey is a friend of mine, Mickey Young, um, old rodeo cowboy. I didn't know he was an herbalist. I just knew him from church. And <laughs> anyway, uh, he's got a company called Silver Lining Herbs that does horse supplements. And so I call him up and I say, so Mick, uh, got this dog that's trying to die and Roland said to call you. And he says, oh yeah, what's going on? And he says, yeah, you need a bag of number 27 is what you need. So he came over to my clinic and gives me a little bag full of green powder, you know, a Ziploc bag. And so we do this drug deal in the parking lot. And uh, <laughs> I, I started giving it to her. She wasn't eating at all. So I just, you know, mix it with a little water and syringed it into her mouth and and uh, the next day she wanted to eat. And three days later, she went home right as rain, completely resolved. Wow. And, uh, you know, and it wasn't anything magic about the form. It was just, you know, the usual suspects for liver stuff, organ grape and burdock and milk thistle and things like that. But it had a huge impact on her. Um, and so I started you know, really getting into it. I mean, I'd been dabbling before, but I started really, really getting into it and, uh, you know, spent the next, you know, 20 years, I guess, really, really working with herbs a lot uh, in the vet practice. And then eventually I went to naturopathy school and opened a, a human practice. And so, you know, if you're a dog, you go to that building. If you're sick as a dog, you go to the other building and we'll <laughs> figure it out one way or the other, you know. But anyway, it was, a, <laughs> it's been sort of an adventure. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how I got started. Hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, I know Um, you've opened a lot of us, our eyes, just how healing herbs can be with animals. A very famous um, case study I've seen of yours is with Max, if I remember correctly, and this yeah, incredible yeah, wound. Good old, yeah. <laughs> you, mem- you remember Max? Yeah. And the, the pictures are pretty horrific. Um, <laughs> they are. <laughs> yeah. And then the healing process from that is just incredible. Yeah. And, you know, wound management was something I did a ton of over the years, and Max wasn't the worst one. Uh, mm-hmm. But and there's a lot of, I have a blog over on my website. Um, homegrownerbalist.net and there's lots of case studies of different things but um, there's some other wound cases there but you know that's another case where there was really nothing surgically or medically that I could do for that dog and the herbs completely resolved it in fact he just died uh, I got an email from his from his mom a year or two ago and she sent me a picture of this old gray Labrador you know with the gray muzzle and <laughs> said, just want to let you know, Max passed away and he spent his whole life running around on that leg, wow. you know, with no trouble at all. And he'd, he'd gotten tangled up in the back tire of a pickup. He jumped out of a pickup, had too much rope. And so he hung over the side and the tire was like a belt sander on his leg and just took all the flesh off the inside of the leg and wore the bone down about 20%. So he had open bone marrow and sepsis. And by the time I got him, he was really, really sick, you know, temp of 106 and and thinking about dying real hard. Um, but, yeah, herbs were, you know, when I first got him, I put him on IV antibiotics. He's going to die, you know, and I'm a vet. That's what you do. 
Um, and the next day, his fever still through the roof. And so I put him on a different big gun IV antibiotic and did nothing. You know, next day, he's still going to die. And I thought, why aren't those antibiotics getting into that infected bone marrow? And, you know, the, the voice in my head says, because all the circulation to that bone marrow is out on the tire, dummy. Give him, oh. you know, you're thinking about this all wrong, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh, geez, I got to start thinking like an herbalist. And I got some golden seal and calendula powder, mixed it with a little water and smeared it into that bone marrow, literally. Put him on a big dose of echinacea and, um, you know, 12 hours later, he wanted something to eat. Mm -hmm. and was up and at him. And, and it took about... And and from that point on, you know, and I was already using some poultice material and comfrey and stuff to try and accelerate the healing. But the the miracle with Max was wasn't healing the wound. It was reversing that sepsis, you know. Mm -hmm. And really it was, you know, high frequent doses of echinacea, you know, calendula, again, the usual suspects. I mean, I had on some immune supporting stuff and some antibacterial stuff, you know, and it, herbs. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he, he uh, they sent me a picture not too long ago of him and said he'd lived a good old life and lived mm -hmm. happily ever after running around chasing rock checks with that leg. And <laughs> hmm. That must so, be very yeah. satisfying. I'm sure you have many stories of that. Of yeah. Happy animals and people. Yep. I'm curious, yep. how accepted are herbs within veterinary school i mean you mentioned they kind of beat it out of you back in the day when you went is it yeah. changing at all <clears throat> i haven't been to veterinary school for a really long time yeah right <laughs> even i don't know your doing. colleagues like are you know do people yeah. are they excited to hear um, what you're doing do they look well down at i'll you? tell you yeah they are they are and you know the kid that kid the gentleman that bought my veterinary practice here a year or two ago was you know very interested in keeping that going, you know, and learning some things and using some herbs and uh, the clientele, the veterinary, the people that own animals are very, very interested. You know, there's a very high demand for uh, natural remedies and holistic remedies. Um, and I never had any opposition from clients. Uh, veterinarians vary a lot. Some of them are all in and some of them are all out. You know, and mm -hmm. it's just like the medical profession right. uh, a little bit. Um, and I understand that, you know, as a, as a guy who's medically trained, um, if you're using pharmaceuticals on a person or an animal, you need to know what they're going to do and how they're going to do it and what to expect. And herbs and drugs don't always play well together. And so they don't want wrenches thrown into the works. They need to know what's going on. They don't know diddly about herbs. And so they can't. You know, they can't support that. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you understand both, you, you can do amazing things because some are, sometimes the herbs make the drugs work way better. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes they inhibit the side effects. I mean, they can do a lot of good things. Sometimes they make your liver get rid of them way too fast. Sometimes they make the drug not work or not be absorbed. So, that you know, you have to understand both to use both. But I think I think uh, the veterinarian the veterinarians in the profession are getting more open-minded about it and less, you know, more willing to learn about it. Mm -hmm. And anybody that's willing to learn about it, I mean, it's a no-brainer to use it. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the things you can do with plants are astounding compared to the things you can do with pharmaceuticals. You know, I mm -hmm. had, in my vet practice, I had a couple of cupboards about that big with, you know, with drugs in them. And I had a whole room full of herbs, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have a medicine that can make, tissue heal faster or, you know, make your liver really happy and get rid of jaundice or what. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with herbs and the complexity of the medicine in a plant is so much more vast than the, the one thing that's in the drug, you know, mm -hmm. so. It's really... Which is especially important for say infections, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and for everything else too, it's a package yeah. deal, you know, yeah. God, God made these phenomenal delivery systems mm -hmm. and, uh, we, you know, reductionist science, we want to understand things. So we take it apart in a million pieces and say, that's the piece that matters, mm -hmm. but all the other pieces are really important too, you know? Yeah. And so if you eat the plant, you get the whole package. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I often say, you know, when I have instances of like, let's say I have a a sprain that's hurting me and then I put on comfrey and I have really quick results. And I think, what do people do without 
herbs or this week right. I was um, coming down with a cold and I just hit all my favorite numbers and the cold never manifested. And I think, what do people do without herbs? You know, they're just so incredibly valuable. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I was watching a, a documentary about, um, you know, people that were traveling West, you know, back in the 1800s that had nothing, you know, and they were running into some trouble with, you know, starving and illness and all these things because of the, you know, the Oregon trail was hard for people, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm watching and it was a, dramatization but they're walking through the desert through the sagebrush and stuff and i'm saying eat that eat that eat that you know <laughs> use that for the medicine use that for the medicine. you guys are missing the whole show of what you could be doing if you knew what the plants were for mm -hmm. you know it's just it's it's uh it's a really precious thing to to be acquainted with those little green rascals and all the wonderful things they want to do for us you know mm -hmm. absolutely well, I'm excited to hear what you have to share about teasel. This is a plant that I admittedly don't work with a lot, but is a plant that I've, it's such a fascinating plant, both in its gifts and well, as well as how it grows. And I'm excited to hear what you have to share about it. Teasel is a fun plant. It's an amazing plant. You know, I have to tell you the, I didn't know anything about it either. I never didn't even know what it was. And I was actually driving down the road with a buddy of mine who's actually a plant scientist. I saw the plant growing in the ditch bank along the side of the road, and I had this intense feeling, you've got to learn this plant. I mean, it was big, you know, and you kind of learn to follow those feelings, you know. Absolutely. And I asked him, I said, Fred, what plant is that? He says, well, I don't know what that is. I says, you've got a degree in plant science. You need to get your money back from that college, you know. <laughs> You're supposed to know these things. That's why I hang around with you. Anyway, um, <laughs> he didn't know what it was. But a week later, I was at a buddy's house uh, who worked for me, and he's an herb guy, you know, and I saw the plant. I had that same feeling. Hmm. And I says, what is that plant? And he says, it's teasel. I says, what's it good for? He says, well, I don't know that it's good for anything. I says, no, no, it's really good for something. And I actually grabbed a shovel and dug up roots and started a tincture that day knowing nothing about it wow. and got out all my old dusty herb books, say, what is going on here? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of an unfashionable herb you know they used to use it a lot back in the old days but it's sort of i don't know bell bottoms teasel you know things go in and out uh but uh <laughs> i think it's ready for a comeback mm -hmm. and i was reading in the old dust year books and they used to use it for pain and neuralgias and weird pains they couldn't explain and and i started doing some research stephen harrod buner was doing some great work with it on lyme's disease mm -hmm. so i said okay well you know, what's the big deal? I don't know anybody with weird nerve pain or Lyme's disease, why it's such a big deal for me. And the day I was pressing the tincture, I mean, I'm actually literally pressing the tincture. This lady comes in and she says, Doc, I've got this horrible nerve pain. I was in an accident years ago and I have all this scar tissue and nerve entrapment and nothing helps. I mean, horrible pain all the time. Do you have anything? I'm not pressing the tincture, you know? <laughs> so, well, maybe I do. <laughs> anyway, I gave it to her and she took it for a couple of weeks and the pain went away. I mean, it, it felt better immediately, but in two weeks it was gone forever. Hmm. And so I got really interested in teasel and what I've learned about it is that, you know, you can use it for pain if you have, you know, arthritis or a sore shoulder or whatever, you know, you can take teasel internally or you can put it on topically even as a tincture, just spray the tincture right on you. And it works really good uh, for pain. But Sometimes we have pain that's old pain from something that happened a long time ago, you know, phantom pains and memory pains. And mm -hmm. it's almost like, you know, when your computer gets frozen up and you got to reboot the dumb thing so it remembers what the mouse is for. <laughs> Sometimes our nerves do that and they feel mm -hmm. like it's their job to tell you all day, every day that you were in an accident 20 years ago. But there's nothing active happening. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just an old obsession they have with that injury. And sometimes, in my experience, sometimes Teasel turns that off. Hmm. So sometimes it reboots that nervous system computer. And I've had it a number of cases, not always. Sometimes there's still something active going on. You know, you got a bone spur or something, some inflammation, some damage. But in some cases, it just makes it be done. And, I mean, it's almost, I mean, it's really a miraculous huge blessing you know it's really cool mm -hmm. 
I've also used it on, you know, that same week I was at a conference and I'm at my, you know, table selling my book and yakking to people about herbs. <laughs> and this gal walks up and she says, do you have anything for MS? And I started to say, oh, I don't know anything about MS. You know, dogs don't get MS. We don't even talk about MS in veterinary school. You know, I mean, I started to apologize for knowing nothing about what I could do to help this lady. And, and I had clear as clear nerve pain, hmm. nerve pain. And so I said, I don't know, but try this. And, uh, and she said, you know, she took some home and uh, emailed me back. What I said to her, and I didn't know why I did this either, but I, I started to say, just take a half a teaspoon or a teaspoon, you know, a couple times a day. That's what I'd done with the other gal, right? Uh, and I started to say that, and I, and I felt like, nope, nope, nope. And I heard myself saying to her, I want you to take one drop three times a day and increase it by a drop every day. And if you get to more than a teaspoon or so, holler, let me know, right? I got a call from her about two weeks later, and she says, she says, Doc, you got to send me a picture of that plant. I don't ever want to not have this plant. Mm -hmm. Because when I hit, you know, 14 or 15 drops a couple of times a day, it was like a switch went off and I feel way better. And I didn't oh. cure the MS, but she felt way better. And this was a gal that two or three days a week, her husband was carrying her to the shower because she was having a bad oh. day, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and a year later, I'm actually telling this story. I was on a plant walk. We're up in the boondocks, you know, look at it stuff in the woods and this gal raises her hand in the front row and says it was me no way and i'm like oh, now we're all balling you know yeah and she says she says i'm off all my meds and i feel pretty good most of the time you know wow. and i've only had you know you don't have a ton of people with ms in the practice but i've had seven or eight people i'm working with a couple right now currently and every one of those people says my doctor keeps telling me I have no idea why you're still walking in here. You know, you should be in a wheelchair by now. You should be way worse than you are. Whatever you're doing, keep doing. And it's not curing them. It's not, you know, but it's, and I don't know, have no idea what the mechanism is. Some, some guy with a microscope and some mice is going to have to figure that out someday. But, you know, it has strong effects on nerves and, you know, MS is a, you know, the myelin on the sheaths of the nerves breaks down. I mean, it's a nerve issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how it's working, but it really is in my experience, which is very limited and not statistically true. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, when the ninth guy comes in, I'm going to try it on him too, right? Because mm -hmm. it's worked on the other eight. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> but anyway, it's, a, it's really an interesting plant. Um, so certainly, you know, I would certainly want the word to get out for people to be trying it for different things. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, Stephen Harold Buner used it for limes. I've used it. I only see, I've only done one or two limes cases because we don't see it around here, but it seemed to help them. Um, for that, I've done it on fibromyalgia cases. I've done it on other just weird nerve pain things. Hmm. Uh, and sometimes it just makes it go away for a couple hours and you have to put it on again, like other, you know, like skullcap or valerian or hops or things like that. But sometimes if they do it for a while, it really does, you know, fix that pain in hmm. a significant way. So. And speaking of yeah. hops, the recipe that you shared with us is a teasel and hops pain spray, which I'm very intrigued about. I've been turning to hops um, more and more recently for pain. So especially, hops you know, spasmo yeah. spasmodic pain and <clears throat> pain with yeah. tension. So I love the combination and I'd love to hear more from you about it. Yeah. So it's just... Uh, you know, two herbs that I find are very good for pain that work in very different ways. And so one of the smart things to do as herbalists is to attack that thing from more than one direction. Uh, something physicians could learn from. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, hops is really great for, for pain. It's in uh, the Cannabaceae family, which is the same family that cannabis is in, but it doesn't have any of the THC intoxicating marijuana things that cannabis has, but it seems to have as much or more power to resolve pain, uh, you know, binds with those little cannabinoid receptors and makes them happy and uh, does good things for pain. But I've used it topically um, for pain a lot. And, and, you know, that's a more temporary fix, you know, it's not, it's not undoing it like teasel will once in a while, but it's another, it's another great 
thing. So it's it's just a nice combination. Of those two guys together can often, and I just make the tincture and spray it on. I'm using mm-hmm. it topically, mm-hmm. um, just as needed. Uh, and are there particular I mean, types of pain that you see this? I mean, you've kind of mentioned with teasel old pain that's kind of set in the nervous system. Uh, we mentioned spasmodic pain. But any other? It doesn't really guidelines. matter. Doesn't matter. Any, okay. Any, no, they don't care. Uh, <laughs> you know, pinched nerves, sore muscles. You know, whatever you got that hurts, and you spray something on it, it fixes it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've used it on lots of things. I have a, you know, I had the way I discovered that hops was good for pain. You know, I'd always used it for, you know, GI stuff and uh, stress stuff, and you know, it's a nervine and it does a lot of good things. It's got some mild antibiotic properties for gut infections. I've I'd always used it internally for stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I'd never used it for pain, and I was I'm actually writing a book on medicinal trees and shrubs. And I was trying to figure out what to do with the vines, you know, because I'm not going to write a book about vines. (laughs) And so I said, oh, I'll put the vines in the tree book. They're climbing the trees. And so I was, I couldn't remember how many M's were in humulus. (laughs) And so I looked up on Wikipedia. They know how to spell things. And, and, you know, they're humulus lupulus. There's only one M, by the way, if anyone's listening and taking careful notes. Uh, But (laughs) anyway. And I saw their family Cannabaceae, which I knew but hadn't thought about for 10 years. And I thought, well, holy cow, that's Cannabaceae. I wonder if that's good for pain. And and as I was grabbing my pencil to write down how many M's were in humulus, I had this shooting pain in my wrist. I'd mm-hmm. lifted a couch or something a couple of weeks before and had this really bad neuralgia in my wrist. And I And I thought, wow, that hurts. And I thought, I should spray some hops on it and see what happens. Went to the herb room the shipping room for the herb, you know, that we have a little herb supplement company and grab a bottle of hops and start sloshing it on my wrist. And my son-in-law comes out and says, you know, Patrick, we've got little spray tops for those bottles. They're just <laughs> right over <laughs> I'm standing in a puddle of hops, you know, and I didn't get over there. It wasn't 10 feet away. I didn't get to the spray bottle before that pain was gone, you know? And so I have become a big fan of hops <laughs> topically for pain. Uh, and it, you know, it's good for all those other things too. Um, but, uh, yeah, great plants, great, great treasures. These yeah. little guys. Yeah. Wonderful duo. I'm sure it's going to be helpful for many people. Thank you so much for sharing that recipe. And for listeners, if you want to download your copy, you can visit the show notes at herbs with Rosalie podcast.com. Was there anything else you'd like to share about teasel before we move on? Um, well, it's a biennial plant and mm-hmm. so it's a two year cycle and the roots, the medicine. And so the only important thing is if you're going to harvest your own, you want to get the root either at the end of the first year or the early spring of the second year before it shoots up to flower and seed and die. But other than that, you know, just the timing of harvest is is the only real thing that matters on it. Nothing looks like teasel. You know, it's very easy mm-hmm. to, to identify. So it's super safe that way. And there's several species and I've used several species and I don't care which one I use. They all seem to work fine. So. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before we do move on, I just have a personal interest in wondering about rattlesnake bites and herbs. Um, Yes. Rattlesnakes are a personal phobia of mine, and I do get to live by them. The snakes where I live Uh are very um, mild, and you don't really hear about a lot of problems. Uh, But my motto is that I always have like two ounces of echinacea tincture in my little backpack when I'm out hiking. And I'm going to go to the hospital, but I'm going to have that with me too. But I just, I want to hear from you because I know you have actual experience. This is not going to be like the, yes. you know, you read it in a book sometime. So right. <laughs> if you don't mind me asking about rattlesnake no, bites and nerves, and I'd like to hear about it. Yeah. No, I've treated a number of rattlesnake bites um, over the years, only in the veterinary practice. The, in the naturopath practice, I never see one. I guess when they hear that noise, they don't stick their head under the bush and say, why are you making that noise? <laughs> Yeah, I will not do that. It's always just a, for the record. <laughs> I know it's it's always a Labrador and it's always on his nose, oh, you know. <laughs> oh. well. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, so rattlesnake venom and brown recluse spider venom and hobo spider venom, all three of those venoms are very similar. They have an enzyme in them called hyaluronidase, uh, which dissolves hyaluronic acid, which is the glue that holds your cells together, right? And so um, echinacea is uh, an herb that has a chemical in it that's a hyaluronidase inhibitor. 
So the echinacea actually stops the, the venom from dissolving the tissue. Um, and echinacea, just because she's a real sweetheart, also stimulates your body to make more hyaluronic acid. You know, that's the other thing echinacea likes to do. Uh, one of a 20 other things she likes to do. Um, and of course, you know, she's got some immune stimulating properties, some mild antibiotic properties, you know, some good things for the infection from the bite. But mostly she's stopping it from dissolving. So I put that in. The other uh, herbs I put in my formula are dandelion root just because it's a, you know, liver tonic and a kidney tonic help eliminate toxins. I put plantain in um, because plantain's astounding for pulling poison out of the body. Um, and I put marshmallow in. And the reason I put marshmallow is because in my experience, um, marshmallow has, and marshmallow's a great herb. I mean, if I only had five herbs, she'd be on the list. You know, that's an amazing plant. But one of the things I see in marshmallow that most people don't, use it for or see is that if I have an animal come in that has a really serious injury and they're starting to have tissue death, like they're starting to get the line and everything below that line is going to die and fall off, you know, pre gangrene, early gangrene. If I get marshmallow on that wound topically and in that body internally, I've never once not had that line gone in 12 hours. Wow. Never once. I mean, marshmallow just has a capacity to go in and talk tissue out of dying. Um, and I don't know if it's cause she's really cute or really personable or what it is, but she can talk those guys into taking one for the team and hanging in there. Uh, that's so anyway, interesting so to hear. Are... Cause I know historically marshmallow was used. I mean, it was called mortification yeah. root and it's used for wounds. And I've read about that yeah. a lot historically. And I've always said, I think there's a lot of potential here, <clears throat> but mm -hmm. I don't work a lot with wounds. So it's great to hear yeah, that. Well, and you think about it as being soothing for a wound, the mucilage. You know, and that's absolutely true too, but it's doing way more than that. It's, it's re stopping tissue death. Uh, and anyway, so that's the formula. I, I, I call it vitamin sting, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, the plantain, echinacea, marshmallow and dandelion root equal parts. And I put it on topically and I give it internally and I do it. If it's a bite, I do it frequently. I mean, I'm going to be doing that every three or four hours. Mm -hmm. Um, probably for three or f a couple of three days. And then once things settle down, I'll do, you know, a couple of times a day for a couple of weeks. That's how I do a rattlesnake bite. Hmm. And I've never had one that didn't, you know, wherever they are with tissue loss and swelling and trouble, wherever we start the formula, that's where the trouble stops, you know? Hmm. Um, and I, like I say, I've had, you know, a number of cases over the years, so. Wow. Works really oh, well. Thank you so much for sharing that. May I never yeah. have to use that ever, <laughs> <laughs> except to yeah. share what I learned from you. <laughs> um, well, I hope you don't. Yeah, well, I will definitely not put my head under the bush to wonder what that is. Yeah, don't do, it. don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> no problem. No problem. That's right. They, they, uh, you know, they always talk about herbs being snake oil. And snake oil, my understanding is that snake oil actually was echinacea root. And so next time your physician says, oh, that stuff's just snake oil, say, oh, I'm so glad you're a believer. Aren't those hyaluronidase inhibitors amazing? You know, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> love it. But great plants. Well, I'd love to talk about all the different offerings you have because you are such a wealth of knowledge and experience. And you share that through your school, through your books. And I know people are going to want to know how they can hear more from you. Well, so, yeah, we have a. Uh, you know, homegrownherbalist.net is the website and we have an herb supplement company. I've got, I don't know, 80 or so formulas for whatever you can think of and single herbs too. We grow, we try and grow as much of our own stuff as we can. Oh, wow. Can't grow everything, uh, but we grow some. Uh, and then I've written a couple of books, The Homegrown Herbalist and uh, The Homegrown Herbalist Guide to Medicinal Weeds are the two books. And those are on Amazon, or you can go to homegrownerbalist.net and buy them. And then These we books have... are, are highly rated, and I love all the commentaries about how humorous they are. So, <laughs> person, people we, love it. Yeah, they, I don't know. The guy that wrote them is kind of a nut. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we uh, and then we have the school. We have an online uh, school, the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. And it's lifetime enrollment. Um, mm. And uh, people really like it. I've had a lot of... Uh, you know, we have about 
5,000 students, I think, uh, and uh, everywhere in the world. I mean, we have, we have, and it's really fun. We, we enjoy it. Uh, it's a real hands-on in the trenches medicine because that's how I learned it. You know, I, I learned herbal medicine by doing it all day in, you know, really, you know, in the vet practice week, I get to do whatever I want, you know? And so we got to play with lots of things with herbs that sermon religious don't get to play with. So it was, mm. it was a good laboratory, you mm -hmm. know, to learn things, but. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, we'll have all that information in the show notes and on screen and everything. So people can find you easily. Well, tell you what, really, so you email me your address and I'll send you those books because I have a couple of yearbooks and they're really good. Oh, <laughs> sounds like fun. I will take you So if any that. of you guys haven't bought Rosalie's books, go buy them. Oh, really good. thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, our last question of the show is uh, one we're asking everybody for season 10, and that is, who have you learned from apart from the plants themselves? Who has your teachers been? Um. You know, I don't have a, a formal education in herbal medicine. I didn't go to herb school or nature. I went to nature path school. They made me teach the herb stuff when I went. I thought maybe they should give me a discount, but they didn't. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we all have mentors, even sometimes that we haven't met uh, that have really impacted us. And I think, uh, you know, one of my favorites was Michael Moore. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote uh, Medicinal Plants of the Mountain West and Medicinal Plants of the Pacific West and the Desert and Canyon West. He has four or five books. Um, but uh, Michael Moore was, you know, I wish I could ever have met him. He seemed like mm -hmm. a great guy. And he certainly was a beautiful blend of science and understanding, you know, chemistry and physiology and also just loving the plants and mm -hmm. feeling the plants and hearing the plants. And really, I mean, that connection... You know, he spent a lot of his life as a professional wild crafter, you know, so he's out in the boondocks and every single plant he talks about, you know, he was trying it to see what it did. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't mm -hmm. just academic for him. It was a very much a lifestyle, uh, learn by doing kind of a thing. So he was, he's somebody that I had a lot of respect for. Um, and also then, that quirky you know, sense of humor too. Which yeah. And he was, yeah, he was, <laughs> he was really funny. Um, but, you know, he also wrote a book called Los Remedios, you know, The Remedies, mm -hmm. uh, which which was a bunch of sort of a collection of remedies that the, the curanderas used. The, the curanderas were the little, you know, the herb ladies and the midwives and stuff in southwestern United States and Mexico and the stuff they'd been doing forever. And it was just a culturally... It was a cool that he paid homage to those guys and, and mm -hmm. wanted to save and preserve what they'd been doing, you know. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, really a great, great, really great, great person, near as I could tell. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing about him. Yeah. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have you. It's been great to get to meet you in real life, not just through email and reading your blog, <laughs> et cetera. So thank you so much for being on the show and for sharing your experience and wisdom with us. Well, I feel the same way, Rosalie. It was delightful to be able to sit down with you and visit a little bit. I've been uh, a, a fan and a friend forever, even though I'm very far away and we don't ever get to talk. I've just always had nice thoughts about you. So. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> You're doing great work. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. And thanks again for being on the show. You betcha. Thanks for being here. Don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com to download your beautifully illustrated recipe card and to get a transcript of the show. There, you'll also be able to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is the best way to stay in touch with me. You can also visit Dr. Patrick Jones directly at homegrownherbalist.net. If you'd like more herbal episodes to come your way, within well, one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube and your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks, and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. 
Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. Michelle is the tech wizard behind the scenes and Karen is our student services coordinator and customer support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. It takes an herbal village to make it all happen, including you. One of the best ways to retain and fully understand something you've just learned is to share it in your own words. With that in mind, I invite you to share your takeaways with me and the entire Herbs with Rosalie community. You can leave comments on my YouTube channel, on the herbswithrosaliepodcast.com show notes page, or simply hit reply to my Wednesday email. I read every comment that comes in and I'm excited to hear your herbal thoughts on teasel and herbal medicine for animals. Okay, you've lasted to the very end of this show, which means you get a gold star and this herbal tidbit. Well, teasel is a fascinating plant. It's originally from Northern Africa, Asia, and Europe. It generously grows as a weed in North America. As Patrick mentioned, it's a biennial plant. It has a two year life cycle. In the second year, the flower heads emerge around the summertime. These flower head spikes have narrow tubular flowers which are densely crowded together. The teasel flowers begin to bloom in the middle of the spike and they have these kind of light lavender color flowers. But as they continue to bloom, which can go on for about a couple months, the flowers separate. So there's a ring of flowers moving towards the top and one towards the bottom. Those long tubular flowers attract long tongue bees, butterflies, and skippers. The dried flower head is often used in floral arrangements. As a reminder, when harvesting teasel, you wanna harvest the taproot at the end of the first year of growth or the beginning of the second. Enjoy teasel. <laughs>